So what are we talking about when we mention the terms natural resources and uh, conflict? Conflict we've already defined in earlier weeks as being either between states or within states. Within state conflicts, we usually have two thresholds of 25 battle deaths or 1,000 battle deaths fought on either side between the government and an armed group that wants to take control of either the entire state or part of it. And so we want to focus on today on natural resources and defining them in a way that's consistent with the existing literature. And uh, a couple of questions when we're trying to decide what is a natural resource or what type it is, um, is by focusing on that that first thing uh, exactly. What type of resource are we talking about? Either extracted uh, would be considered a natural resource like a mineral, kind of like a lot of the minerals that we produce here in Australia, rather than produced, like uh, agriculture uh, that requires uh, human effort and a creation of something new rather than just taking something out of the ground that had already uh, existed. The next question is, what is the salient quality of the resource? For example, uh, the quantity, how, how much is produced, by a particular country or a particular area, how much it is actually worth, either domestically but most often on the international stage in commodity markets, uh, how much is exported by a particular country, and um, how much money the government gets from that production, which is going to connect to the South Sudanese example that we're going to be talking about later on today. The third question is how should we normalize the values to try to understand the scale of this uh, resource production in a way that's meaningful to the research questions that we have. Um, for example, it, uh, it, several means are common in the conflict literature. How much of uh, the economic value of a production of a natural resource the size of it relative to GDP, or how much it represents the total amount of exports of a particular country, how large this uh, export value is relative to how many people there are within a country, uh, to normalize it by population, uh, or as a percentage of government revenue. So if the government gets resource rents from the production, how much of that actually pays for the budget of the government and the government services that they provide. There are a lot of different types of uh, natural resources. Fuel minerals are the ones that I started with with that initial slide, oil and natural gas. Oil, of course, makes petroleum in which uh, the vast majority of international trade depends on. Natural gas also gets uh, exported and produced uh, as well as used uh, domestically. There's non-fuel minerals uh, that are important like uh, gold or the coltan that goes in your phone, uh, cobalt, tantalum. Unfortunately, cobalt and coltan are concentrated in, in a few countries, the vast majority of the known world reserves, including in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, a prototypical example of natural resources not leading to economic development, but actually instability and conflict. Uh, and then gemstones, the last uh, type of natural resource that we're going to be talking about, and that connects to the existing literature, diamonds, rubies, emeralds, um, everything that uh, those kind of adventure movies uh, depend on. A lot of these resources now can be provided to us in a relatively easy fashion oil and natural gas. Natural gas is often piped to homes, although that's uh, increasingly being regulated out of existence here in the ACT due to the um, pollution effects that uh, become more established by research within the home in, in recent years. Uh, I, I showed that video, uh, video the, the still of the photo outside of Baku and Azerbaijan with the oil derricks running. Uh, this this photo here is actually of one in California. Growing up in Los Angeles, it might surprise you to know that scattered around these this incredibly dense urban area, there are random 
um, fenced off areas in which you do have small uh, scale uh, oil production because the area does have a lot of uh, oil wealth beneath the ground that is currently being used. Uh, gold, you can go to the Australian Mint down the road and and buy gold. You can uh, buy it online as well as buy ETFs or um, uh, virtual products. You don't have to worry about storing some of this natural resources if you want to invest it as a store of value given the uh, rising inflation that we've seen in, uh, in recent months. And then uh, diamonds, something that now that I I am married. I had to learn a lot about something that I really didn't have to think about until that time period. But now you can buy online. Um, the most, <laughs> the strangest example that I could come across is in this online website, Blue Nile. Uh, originally used it in the U.S., though they now have uh, an Australian website as well, in which you can spend. Uh, for the most expensive uh, diamond, not in a setting, you have to pay extra for the setting, is worth almost 3.5 million Australian dollars. Very small, they'll put it in a pouch. I would encourage you to get insurance on it, um, but you can get almost anything, including um, valuable natural resources delivered to your door. I haven't seen um, gas deliveries uh, come to the door yet, but Maybe that's a function of time. I guess with uh, Teslas and solar panels, you are getting uh, a renewable resource uh, at your door for some people. How do we define resource rents? Uh, the the quote from Ross used in Fail and Dubois, um, Dubois, Dubois, called Dubois, uh, profits above and beyond production costs, where the costs include a normal rate of return on the capital invested. So that's the profit of producing these resources, including uh, um, uh, the, above the amount it actually costs to produce it. And so those resource rents can be distributed to private or public corporations, to individuals, to states uh, or to international actors that often invest in developing countries to be able to produce these resources. And this could lead to potential rentier effects, which is a term you might have come across in your other classes, but it's resource revenues that allow uh, governments to be able to to choose to spend these resources in ways that could benefit their their citizens as well as the political leaders. They could reduce their taxes as well as increase public goods and private patronage. Used to spend um, time in, in Alaska after graduating undergraduate. There, was, there wasn't any um, personal state taxes or, um, or sales tax because the government got so much revenue from oil production in the northern part of the state on the, the north slope up near Barrow, uh, Alaska. And indeed, if you spend more than nine months a year in the state, uh, you would be cut a check every year from the, um, from the um, oil producers that sustained the support for the, for the resource production by giving people direct checks. Uh, it's a, it's, uh, there's always a spike in uh, travel agencies bookings to Hawaii because usually we'd always end up getting it in the cold part of the year. Um, but it was a way that, it, that the resource benefits flowed directly back to the citizens in the affected state. So um, public goods, increased spending on infrastructure or uh, welfare, as well as pri uh, private patronage, as we're going to see in examples of increased corruption in these areas that when there is a large amount of money, some of it is not publicly known. Um, there is a potential for, uh, for bribery or through patronage to um, allow this production to continue. It could also raise risks in depending on these sorts of revenues, as we see, as we saw in the private, uh, the previous example of Venezuela, in which there was a large dependence on resource rents to pay for for public goods um, during the time of Hugo Chavez, and then in the years afterwards, with the oil price uh, declined, there was a lot of hardships and challenges to Maduro's leadership, and the only established way to try to reduce the risks of having to depend on one resource and the price in the international markets for this resource is through diversification, which we're going to be talking about in a second, um, because it 
risk, it reduces the risk of authoritarian collapse because it's kind of like a diversified retirement pro portfolio in your super that if one thing uh, goes down dramatically, if you have other things that aren't directly tied to that resource, it can reduce your risk of, of authoritarian collapse at the national level or just economic um, hardship at the individual level. Uh, Fail and Dubuis look at five resources, coal, forestry production, minerals, natural gas, and oil, uh, to look at how that could affect uh, authorit uh, authoritarian survival. We're going to talk about that in, in the workshop in a second. Um, and in their authoritarian regime measure, based on Barbara Geddes' measure of um, authoritarian regimes, it wasn't clear in whether this regime failure actually included conflict. My instinct is that it does include conflict, but that would be an interesting research question for an honors thesis or an undergraduate essay in which you dig into previous research and their assumptions and just um, tweak it, use a different kind of outcome to see whether that might change the relationship between resource rents and some form of political outcome that you care about. And it's really interesting teaching um, this class and the connections between natural resource production and instability in a country like Australia. The U.S. also um, produces a lot of natural resources with the fracking boom and with the, the previous high price of oil. The U.S. became one of the largest oil producers uh, quite quickly. However, as a percentage of the overall budget of the United States, the U.S. is a lot bigger. It has over 300 million people. It's a lot more diverse than Australia. And I think we are the lucky country in in more ways than one. This summary of the Australian system from the CIA's fact book I really think is interesting that it is a significant exporter of natural resources, energy, and food. It has abundant and diverse natural resources, attract high levels of foreign investment, including extensive reserves of oil, uh, coal, coal, iron, copper, gold, natural gas, uranium, and renewable energy uh, sources. And there's a, a series of major investments. This hasn't been updated in a couple of years, so I'm not exactly sure whether the $40 billion Gorgon literal liquid natural gas project has continued, um, but it is a substantial um, source of the kind of revenues that enables public spending on national universities, uh, as well as the funding for uh, students uh, to be able to come here. Um, so up to two decades, Australia has benefited from the surge in the terms of trade. Um, demand uh, has slowed in recent years with China, as well as the um, diplomatic challenges with China as one of our largest export uh, destinations can show the, the, the risk in depending on a number of resources for our gross domestic product. For our exports, I really think this is a, is a really interesting um, visualization of the size and diversification of our export sector as well as where our resources actually go. So you see iron ore is by far the largest uh, export. Um, petroleum and natural gas, as I mentioned, coal, and then gold, and then it drops off quite quickly um, after that. Um, a lot of uh, diplomatic challenges about the sheep and goat meat, which is only, I don't think there's, the goat meat side of it is as big as the sheep, but there's been political challenges with live uh, exports of that in recent years. Where these things actually go, you can see China buys 40% of our natural um, uh, resource exports um, as of 2020, um, followed by Japan, South Korea, and India, where the U.S. has 4.6% and the U.K. has 4%. It's really surprising that New Zealand, given the close proximity, as well as Indonesia, doesn't have a higher percentage of our um, uh, export recipients. Um, it's interesting to see whether that could be a result of politics or just their own um, their own needs. It's something that I that's outside my research area, but it'd be interesting to look at. So Australia is less diverse in its exports than countries like the United States or the UK. You can go to the link in the slides to take a look at the nature of other countries' exports. Um, but I just wanted to contrast the, uh, the Australian experience with South Sudan, which will be our major case study for this week, in which you have the export of petroleum in 2020 as 80, over 82% of the exports sent abroad. This um, 
total export sector is worth less than US $1 billion, which is dramatically lower than it used to be before the Civil War that broke out in 2013, 2014, which we're gonna be talking about a bit later. And you can see the destination of where these resources go. A huge percentage of goes uh, to China, UAE, and then you, Uganda and Italy uh, are the third and fourth. But you could see a huge dependence on one particular market, which will see the, the impact of that on um, international pressure to try to, to end the conflict to allow these resources uh, to, to grow. And there's a similar um, CIA factbook description of the sector, starting with the fact that it does have abundant natural resources um, and how there used to be higher oil production before the conflict um, and how uh, the oil production has fallen quite quickly after the conflict and that it is quite dramatic on these resources, which kind of leads me to this resource curse, um, which... In the Ross definition, uh, building on Audi, the adverse effects of a country's natural resource wealth on its economic, social, or political well-being. Connecting to Dutch di disease, which I mentioned before, in which you have the sudden discovery and export of a resource can actually lower economic growth in that country because of the pressures on the job market, you have to pay more wages because more people are needed for the resource sector and they have the res the, re uh, the economic resources to pay uh, these people. Um, the uh, effect on the currency could lead to inflation as more of these resources are exported. But uh, most people, like with the Afghan example earlier, says uh, connect it more directly to the social and political negative outcomes that it's uh, often associated with increased corruption and political instability, which we'll get to in just a second. And a part of that connects to one of the major themes of this class and whether you focus on the effects in the short term or the long term. Short term connects to the literature that we've seen in other areas on economic uh, shocks or, or uh, disasters, short-term shocks to the system, and whether that can, and can have a social or political impact on a country or the longer-term levels of these kind of production uh, dependence and whether that is what's actually driving the long-term negative effects in destination states. And you can just visualize this. Uh, we looked at the Venezuelan example and their dependence on oil prices, but for all commodity prices, you can see uh, in this graph, which I really find interesting, looking at how, f how much the basics that we depend on in our day-to-day -day world actually fluctuate quite dramatically in price, that you have the economic crisis at the end of 2007 and 2008, and you had basically all primary commodities decreased almost 50%. Uh, oil uh, decreased 50%, uh, others decreased as well. There was one point in which the price of a barrel of oil reached negative because a lot of the oil futures, um, when the, these futures expire, no one actually wants to get the oil delivered. They're just speculating on the price. And so there was actually a negative value and people were being paid to take the oil because when the entire global system shut down in large part in, um, in the middle of 2020, there wasn't a need for the oil to, to drive everyone to work or to to uh, have the international shipments that we didn't fully realize the importance of maintaining those until uh, 2021. And so you can connect this and you can look at a whole bunch of different graphs, but in looking at oil again, you have these quite dramatic increases in price, like from 2003 up until 2007, in which you're getting $150 US bar for barrels of oil, to a quite dramatic decline to $30 in uh, 2008, as well as in uh, 2020, it was down to, to $20 for a barrel of oil. And now you see the, the increase in, that, uh, in those prices, especially in the spiking after the start of the Russian-Ukrainian war. And so I think the takeaway from all of this is that natural resources include oil and natural gas, which you might think of, but also other resources like forestry goods that certain parts of developing countries could, or uh, cocoa in Cote d'Ivoire, could have a substantial effect on 
a rebel group's ability to gain funds to be able to maintain a low-scale insurrection or to the center of the government to maintain a target for controlling those resources um, for, our, for either elites within the government uh, or um, competing, uh, competing opposition figures. And that leads me to my second uh, lecture question. Um, do you think after last week's uh, focus on agricultural production and this week's focus on natural resources, do you buy the argument that extractive resources are more of a risk than produced resources? That natural resources uh, like uh, oil, diamonds, and other that we can look at, uh, do you buy that by and large those things are more of a risk than things that are produced? Uh, like uh, like uh, cocoa, like wheat, and all those grains that we talked about last week. Please, for those students, leave a comment on Waddle that are doing it. Those of you who are not but are interested, you can leave a comment uh, down below. And it really does um, make you think about what is the dynamics about how much of the value the international system places on certain resources and how easy it is to export or produce can shape um, the political and social effects that it has on the producing countries. And with that, that ends the Defining Our Term segment. Now we're going to be talking about the myriad mechanisms connecting natural resources and conflict.